Hi everyone, Dan here, and I just wanted to put a little snippet about Astroworld and what we do because I want to start getting the word out because I think it's becoming more and more of a, a giant community and I want to get the word out to some other people. So what we do at Astroworld is we do hold, we hold uh, astrophotography chats on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. and Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and we just talk astrophotography. Wednesdays more of a techie kind of advanced uh, intermediate, and Fridays is more of a newbie kind of thing. So if you want to check us out and if you want to, you know, hang out with some semi-decent people that like to go off the rails a little bit and have fun while they're doing it, um, come check us out at astroworldweb.com and you can check out the schedule and you can sign up for all the free giveaways that we do. We just gave away an Eagle 4 Pro, an Optolong filter kit, um, uh, Charles Brackenstein's books and a whole bunch of other stuff. So come to astroworldweb.com, hang out with us, have a good time. And as always, remember to keep imaging keep educating, and clear skies. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.
10 seconds it was more like five but that's okay uh, what's the start of the oh wait wait what happened? i didn't have what? enough time to finish chewing my pretzel uh, we, got, <laughs> we got you yeah we got pete all right cool so yeah so uh so you can see we are at three tonight um eric is coming he's on his way uh and he will be doing his talk he's just running a little late uh should be here about 8 30 so uh we got tonight we got pete jess and myself for the first half hour so there we go uh Hello. dylan says hi thank you kevin for the shout out yes we made 1600 subscribers thank you so much we, we hit two milestones this week we hit 1600 subscribers on youtube and we broke 50 um 50 members in either youtube or patreon 
so we have 52 members on both. Uh, so thank you so much for all the support and everything. You guys and girls are, are completely awesome. So thank you so much. Um, that being said, you guys got to deal with my seven minute spiel here. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll just get that out of the way because we really need to, um, we got to express our thanks to everybody at the beginning. So nobody leaves before hearing it. So here we go. So thank you to our sponsors. We have member sponsors for those of you that are new to the show. Uh, great. Hey, uh, what's up, Tommy? How you doing, Tommy? Welcome. Um, let, let me, so we got sponsors. We got people that give us stuff to give to you. So, uh, first one is Woodland Hills Camera and Telescopes. We give away gift certificates once a month and we give out two biggies, uh, at the end of the year. So, uh, thank you to Woodland Hills Camera and Telescopes. Always a great resource resource. Uh, Pete is, uh, affiliated with the Woodland Hills. Uh, and uh, it's 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 a really great organization. So thank you to Farah and uh, the group over at Woodland Hills. Uh, at our Red Giant level, we got Prima Luce Lab Camera Concepts and Optolong. So uh, we're starting the moist jokes already. No moist jokes tonight. No moisting. Um, so uh, we got Prima Luce Camera Concepts and Optolong, all of them. And if all things work out and the stars align in a certain area. We may have a decent Prima Luce giveaway at Neef, and you must be there to win. So at our super giant level, we have Masters of Pix Insight and IP for AP. We're giving away a free Masters of Pix Insight workshop tonight. So hang out till the end of the show and see if you won uh, the free Masters of Pix Insight uh, workshop. The next one, I believe, is masks unmasked and that's i believe is the uh the the tuesday that's i think the 17th or the 18th of march so it's if you got about a month away but if you don't want to see the masks one you get whatever one you want so uh feel free to let uh pete know when you win and also ip for ap uh another great resource for um processing for photoshop and for pix insight they have tutorials on both so uh, we give a uh, we give a one year subscription to IP for AP once a month. Um, thank you to all our member sponsors, um, our all two off the rails members who are people who are completely crazy and donate a, a lot of money to us um, at fifty dollars a month. Off the rails members Sean Nielsen and Bob D'Amato. Uh, thank you so much for them uh, and and their uh, their patronage. So thank you. Followed by our Quasar members, John G. and Dr. Hassan, um, two people that I know very well. So thank you so much. Charity George, Mike, and Dan. And I believe we just got a new Black Hole member. I think somebody just upgraded that I just saw, and I, I couldn't get it on the uh, on the slide. And I uh, don't remember who it was, but somebody upgraded. So 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 thank you to them. And to our two Red Giant members, Bob and Deborah. Main sequence members, there's a ton now. So thank you to all of them. White Dwarf members. Why does that go so fast, that one all the time? White Dwarf members. And our Protostar members. So if you're interested, join us on Patreon and Astro World TV. You get perks. You get little music videos made by me or, or whoever else. So it's a lot of fun. So join us on Patreon. Um, if you missed it, uh, last week we had Steve Malia from Starfield Optics with Sean Nielsen as well, uh, spoke a little bit about um, their new reflectors and uh, some stuff that's coming up over at Starfield. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's on our YouTube page. Unfortunately, we missed Richard Wright last Wednesday and uh, the internet didn't work out very well. So, uh, so he's going to be coming and giving us a recap of Winter Star Party, hopefully within the next week or so. Uh, so that's going to be really cool to see what happened down there because I heard they had some really nice weather. Bob Denny coming at us on next Wednesday uh, talking about ASCOM Alpaca. Uh, he's going to be coming and hang out with us. This is his second time on Astroworld. Followed by Ivo Stoyanov the next Wednesday. Uh, going to talk about at APT. He's the creator of APT. So we're going to see. He hasn't been on since last March. And when you put out... Um, 2.0 so it's going to be uh, fun to see what new improvements he's made with apt and april 5th we got warren keller coming up uh for his first solo appearance on astroworld tv although he was on astropalooza with all of them 
Um, so it's kind of odd, but he is the last one of the Masters of Pix Insight to come on. He will be here answering questions on April 5th. And of course, feel free to join us on all of our other social media platforms, Discord, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram, Mastodon, whatever. We're on everything. So uh, that being said, we are all done with that. And uh, we're going to go back to D3 up. And there we go. Ooh. And hey, Dan, it looks like we got a new member. So, Ooh. Tommy, how you doing, Tommy? Welcome to White Dwarf. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That makes 53 members of Astroworld. So, so Here's thank you thing. so much. Dennis, Mike, Gideon, welcome, everybody. Any news on Scott? Uh, probably sleeping. The guy works like a works like a crazy mother. I'm telling you, he's mm -hmm. out of his mind. Eric is coming. He's running a little late. He's going to be doing his uh, his talk on uh, mounts. He'll be here, so don't be afraid. Don't leave. Eric will be here probably about eight eight thirty. Um, hey, Dan, so that, if yeah. we mention the calendars. Oh yeah, I still have calendars. I still I thank you. Um, I still have some calendars. I got about five left before I put out the next order. So uh, it's starting to slow down a little bit. But if you want calendars. Um, I still have them. And uh, what's that, Pete? I was going to say for the new members that, that have just seen uh, signed in that don't know what we've done, maybe you could just give a little brief uh, dialogue about that. First, I got to say, ew, I yeah. hate Dan K. Solo. There you go. Um, <laughs> so, so, so that being said, um, yeah. So um, for the new members that are out there and what we do every week and tonight, if you haven't voted, if you haven't voted yet, you got to vote for picture of the week. We got 80 votes already for picture of the week and Bloodstone's not in it. So there's no Twitter malfunction. So, so, so just kidding, Don, just kidding. But, um, you know, we got 80 votes in um, and we got some really, really, really good photos. So if you haven't, if you don't know, we do picture of the week every week, picture of the month every month, and every picture of the month is put into the calendar for the next year. Uh, we do it November to November. So really the December for 22 was the December for 23 picture, just so we could get the, uh, the, the, um, the, the calendar out in time for the new year and all that kind of stuff because it was kind of, kind of rough getting it out this year because it was the first time we did it. Uh, but it's, it's usually about with shipping, probably about 30 bucks for the calendar. Um, and, uh, it came out really, the calendar came out really good. I mean, uh, I, I thought the pictures came out awesome for, for that. I never even heard of this company, but, but they did really, really good. Oh, no way. I didn't know that Mark spike of flats gone. Wow. Looks like John's retiring. He decided to pick it up, then, huh? I guess so. I don't know. He's gonna he's gonna go hit golf balls with uh, Don uh, Don Goldman, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but maybe um, Steve Amalia should pick it up. <laughs> oh man! I mean, I got I got my I got my spike of flat right here. I'll hold on for it for twenty years and maybe sell it for five hundred bucks. <laughs> I am no no idea. Spike a flat? That is that is that is also new to me. I, I learn something new every time I'm on with you guys. So well, there you go. So so spike a flat. Um, spike a flat is a is a maker of flat panels. Oh okay. Oh okay. Okay. Really really good <laughs> solid illumination flat panels that they're known as kind of like the standard for flat panels um mm -hmm. they're, they're really really good they're expensive they're usb controlled they're ascom controlled uh but the, you can get them as big as you want them you know as long as you okay. call them but um I feel like not you, anymore. Feel like, yeah oh no yeah i feel like you guys have and i feel like i've gone to had this exact same question for you the last time you mentioned it i was like who was that <laughs> okay yeah, well, well you. you know what it, it's, it's you know you know the the spike flats are really good i have one now i got I got, well, you know, the spike flats are really big. You know, they're, they're large. I mean, they, they can be small depending on what you got. Oh, my God. My headset just got, got ran oh, over no. by my wheel. Hold on a second. I can't move. Wow. Something's not right here. Hold on a second. It's this new chair. <laughs> 
<laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> it's a, it's a new chair, so I mean, like you know, I I don't know where to put all my wires yet. I got to figure it out. Oh, fair, okay. But um, <laughs> but I, I got these now. Okay. Not cabling through the chair, Dan. No kid, no chair. No, there's no through cabling on the chair. So, uh, so yes, this was this was a birthday present from my uh, from my lovely wife and my and my mother-in-law. So, so I love I, I love. This is the best part about it. The pillow comes off. Nice. Oh, that's kind of awesome. And it's magnetic. So that's uh, even awesome. It's not waterproof. No, it's not waterproof. But, but uh, but this is a flat panel that I've been using. I've been getting really good results with this. Um, and uh, I just got this is the uh, the motor for it. Here. Okay. So basically, it attaches to the flat panel like this, and it moves up and down, and it it doubles as dust cover. Okay. Okay, that is cool. And I do feel like you have actually educated me on that at some point. And that is, and it, it's just as cool the second time as if I remember it being the first time. <laughs> I'm just going to wrap this up. I, st I, I still probably won't get one for a while, but, you know, maybe. <laughs> and yeah, the Giotto comes in as big as you want it. I mean, they will make as much as, if you want to pay for it, they'll make it. Trust me. Um, so go to uh, Prima Luce Labs. Uh, primaluchelab.com or primaluchelab USA, and um, and you'll be able to get whatever you need, along with the outdoor. The, the the motor's about the motor and the panel are about three to four hundred each. So the motor is about three hundred, and the and the, the flap. You don't need the motor. It does come with these little screws, these nylon screws, so you can kind of just like. Put them up against your dew shield, and okay. it'll stay. And it's all uh, US, USB powered and USB C connector. So, nice. Yeah. So pretty cool. Anyway, but well, we're here to talk about I, mounts. I right? do take notes, <laughs> but I lose my notes. <laughs> I just have. I've been trying to do better reading the chat, and I'm like I do take notes. <laughs> hey, no, take notes, please, because I, 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 I don't know what's going on. <laughs> But um, it, it's it's pretty cool. So so tonight we're going to be talking about different types of mounts, right? So Eric's going to be talking about. He, I'm sure he's got a wicked presentation. But since you know he's running a little late, we may as well just start off the conversation a little bit. Um, Pete, you want you want to you want to throw it on? You want to start a little bit? Because I've been talking, I've been talking for like 20 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as I said, I don't want to steal uh, Eric's thunder, but. No, you know, we what, just run around, you know, the circle, what we use, and all that kind of sure. stuff. Sure. Basically, you, you know, when we're looking at mounts, you know, we're looking at all azimuth mounts, equatorial mounts, um, L mounts now with the plane wave, and then now the most recent mounts coming out look like the harmonic drive uh, wave strain mounts. So those would be the different kinds of mounts. And, you know, within each of those, you'll know, definitely have different types of mounts, basically having different types of features. Consequently, the more expensive the mount, the, the, the better the features you have, um, the, the better gearing, um, whether it be a worm gear, um, whether it be a direct drive mount. Um, it, as I said, there's just a multitude of, of different mounts that are out there. So as I said, it's just a matter that when people talk and they give me a call and they say, Pete, I want to get a scope. And I'm thinking, well, what is it that you want to do? And they say, well, I want to do maybe 60% visual and say 40% um, astrophotography. I always tell them, if you're going to decide to get into astrophotography, forget about the scope. Put your focus in the mount because that's going to be the most important piece of equipment. Because when we look at mount for astrophotography, the rule of thumb is you don't really want to push it past 80% of its payload capacity. With visual, yeah, you can run that up to about 99% because, once again, that's not going to be an issue. But... When you start looking at putting in filter wheels, uh, cameras, um, OHE, uh, spacer adapters, and God knows what else you want to put in the optical train, you really want to look at maybe where you're going to be, not at this moment, but think about where you might be three to five years from now. Because we always kind of upgrade our scopes, right? We always think, okay, I might have a Radcat 61 right now, but three years down the road, I might have a W0132. Or in the case like Dan, he's going to have an AP 130. So 
I always suggest is just don't get the mount based upon your equipment that you have right now. Think about where you want to be three to five because it leads into that old adage, buy once, cry once. And that's the secret that you want to do because you want to definitely plan for where you're going to be in the future. So I'm sure that Eric will probably talk a little bit about that. But it seems to me that all of us, the reason why we're on this show is that we're all basically astrophotographers. And so with that, I'm sure that we'll all either have probably equatorial drive mounts, we'll have harmonic drive mounts, or in the case of like with Mark, he'll have the L350, which will be the L mount. And the beauty about the L mounts is, is that you can actually, within one mount, do alt as as well as equatorial. It gives you both modes if you decide, so you can choose to do one or the other. So that's kind of an interesting little thing that we can start off to. And sure, this is going to be a segue getting into what Eric's presentation is going to be all about. Hey, so Pete, let, let me, I, I don't know if Eric's going to, you know, talk about this. He may or may not. Um, but l l let, me, let me ask you a question regarding all these different types of mounts. You know, we got worm gear driven, belt driven, harmonic, all this kind of stuff, single fork, dual fork, uh, I mean, encoders, all this other stuff going on. But I'm real more curious about the payload law. There's a, you know, there's the unwritten law. You you kind of alluded to it a little bit about the, uh, you know, about the 80% kind of thing or visual, you know, go up to whatever. Um, does this rule change from, like, let's say a worm tooth mount to a belt mount to a harmonic mount? Can you get closer to that payload capacity with different types of mounts? or you need to go less with a different type of mount? No, it's going to be interesting is, is that, you know, definitely with the worm, the worm drive mounts, that's the rule of thumb is, is, is pushing it about 80% of what the maximum payload capacity is. Pretty much the same for belt, but when you come to harmonic drive mounts, this is a real technology that's going to be a game changer in this industry because the technology is relatively new for what we do here. So, you know, that's a good question, Dan, is, is that the beauty about the harmonic drive mounts is that let's take a look at the rainbow. Case in point, the rainbow, the RST 300 behind me. I mean, the oh, payload. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, the payload capacity on that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if you could probably push that up to 95 percent, if not, maybe even a little bit more. That I don't know for a fact, because once again, we're saying is, is that once you exceed a certain point, that's when you're going to need to have a counterweight and a counterweight shaft. But think about the fact that with the ultimate in portability, and that's kind of what I think the majority of our viewer memberships are into. They're into, you know, the ultimate in portability. Mm -hmm. How can you beat a harmonic drive mount that you can put on a Manfrotto or a Gitsu tripod uh, and, and, and literally have an AP-130 on it? I mean, you, you can't beat that for the ultimate in portable setup. So you're absolutely right, Dan. Um, I wish I knew the answer to that, but I'm going to say is that you might be able to push that past that at 80% capacity. But but as I said, until these really kind of come into their own, it, they're going to be a game changer in terms yeah. of mounts. I, I really think you're so. Right. Okay, so now I'm, 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 you know, I've heard you guys talk these harmonic drive mounts and whatnot. Um, and I just, you know, as much as I would love to, you know, be able to research every little bit of everything that I hear about it. You know, like in my mind, I kind of catalog it as, you know what, I've got a mount. I like my mount. I kind of keep up on what's going on in the world. What I have is working for me. So I really haven't looked into it. What would be like if I were wanting to, you know, tell us about the harmonic drive mount. Like well, what, that's, you know, a, that's I, I think a great in a nutshell, segue. what exactly is that? that you know? That's a great I mean, segue because I know there was a question in the chat about, you know, what is a mount? Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna simplify it real quick, and I'm gonna give you guys a visual on what this is. So, Jess, which which mount do you have? Um, I have the EQR6, the Skywatcher. And what's the payload capacity of your EQ6? Forty-four pounds. Forty-four pounds with counterweights, right? You gotta have. Yeah. You gotta have yes. probably two counterweights, you know, two yes. eleven or. Yeah, I have both of them. You know, I'm, um, I have both of them on when I have my one twenty seven on there. Uh, when I have my seventy millimeter on, I only need one. So. Okay, so, and how big is it? Is it? Is it? Is it big? Is it? It's heavy. It's big? I mean, it's it's. 
I mean, it weighs all, all, all the whole thing rigged up when everything's on it. It weighs not much. It weighs, you know, not much less than me, you know, so it is, it's quite, you know, I mean, I'm be honest, the thing is as big as I am. Um, when I got my 127 on there, I mean, it's huge. The whole thing weighs about 76 pounds. Okay, so so I think, I think, I think just the of... mount, I think the mount and the tripod with the counterweights is like 76. Okay. Something like that. Um, but I mean, and that's without anything else on it. So. Okay. So that being said, mm -hmm. 44 pounds and the mount weighs 76 pounds. It's a beast. <laughs> okay. So what would you say if I told you that I could have the same weight capacity without counterweights and a mount this size? Now, how do they do that? How? What, tell me about this wizardry. I Look guess that's one, I've seen one handed. This, you know, I've this, seen it and it's <laughs> 44 and it's pounds awesome. without a counterweight. I think it's now how do they make that magic width. happen? What is going on it. inside there? Okay. So actually, Pete, you, you probably are more well versed in the actual workings of the harmonics, I think. Yeah, what is it about that? How are they? I can probably to explain it, but happen? I'll screw it up a little yeah. bit. So you're you're you're, yeah, but, you're the brain like the of small, group. small and portable sounds beautiful. You know, I mean yeah. that part sounds amazing. And I guess I, I guess, yeah, what I'm wondering is like, how do they do that? You know. <laughs> Well, wave, wave strength technology has been around for, for a long time. It's just been recently within our industry that it's really found a home. Um, you know, they use it quite a bit in, in, in machining processes. The unique thing about wave strain is, is that you, you've got basically a tooth gear and then there's another reciprocating gear. And, and the difference between particular gear ratio and a worm gear is, is that if you ever look at a equatorial mount, how many teeth you actually have engaged, you might only have 12 to 15 teeth engaged within the gear itself. But with a harmonic drive mount, you're going to have 30% of the teeth mating to the reciprocating gear. So when you have that much or that many teeth engaged, you're going to have a much higher torque. And consequently, that's the beauty about what wave strain technology brings to our industry. You know, everybody's talking about the fact that, well, wait a minute, what's the periodic error? Who cares what the periodic error is? Because you can always guide that out with, with, with Wayne Strait. You, you know, that's the beauty about the technology. So literally now, instead of having a large, uh, like a Mighty Mount or, or an MX Plus Mount, because of the wave strain technology now, you can have the technology now, basically an amount that weighs no more than eight to 12 pounds, and you can hold it in the palm of your hand. So once again, that's the beauty is, is the torque ratio. You get a much greater torque ratio with, with wave strain technology. Case in point, Dan, look at the counterweight shaft, that bore. I mean, we're looking usually at about a half inch counterweight shaft on a mighty mount. What's the bore size on that counterweight shaft? It's probably what, maybe a quarter of an inch? Less than that, maybe. Um, let me see. Um, I gotta find out what's up with this moist thing. It, no, Sorry, don't don't bring it up. Don't let them. Don't let them suck you in. Don't let them suck you. In. <laughs> um, it looks like it looks like uh, three or five eighths. Yeah, I mean it's a lot. I mean look look at that. I mean it's a lot less. And so the idea is is that once again you can use a. A, a telescope with a camera assembly up to a certain point before you actually have to have a, a counterweight shaft. So once again, for anything that's real portable, my God, how long would it take to set up? Case in point, for the mighty amount, it takes me literally 20 minutes to half an hour to set up. With the with what Dan has, the Nook, Dan, you'll probably be up and running within 20, less than that. You'll probably be up in 10 minutes. Well, let, let me tell that's you. That's the you Pegasus know, one? That's the Pegasus? This, this, is the, this is the Pegasus one. This is a little bit beefier. Then the AM5. Um, okay, because the AM5 is about half the payload capacity of this. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted, just like Pete alluded to tonight, you want to have the mount that you could grow with, and this could go up to mm -hmm. 56 pounds. And, and I'm still, and I'm weak. I, I, I'm holding this like it's nothing. I have no upper body strength at all, zero. Um, and yeah, I remember you guys had the AM5. I think one of you guys was testing it, wasn't it? Yeah, no, no, I, I tested like it a year I, ago. And yeah. this is the yeah. final piece of that video. So 
So I'm, okay. I'm going to be doing, I'm getting my tripod finally on Tuesday. Um, so th that's coming. Mm -hmm. And, and what the deal is, is that, um, the reason why I went with the Pegasus as opposed <laughs> to the, the, um, the AM five and, and, uh, the HEM 27 and, and all the other ones that the Mark threes, um, <laughs> But uh, but um, I'm trying. To, I'm trying. I'm just. just but uh, but the the whole <laughs> thing is is that I wanted something that I could grow with, and this starts me at 44 pounds without a counterweight. Now, if I wanted to put something out, if I wanted to put a nine and a quarter, you know what I missed about when I had, I tested the AM5 for a month, and you know what I missed it about missed about that whole thing. I took the whole AM5 with the red cat on it. And walked it outside and plopped it down, and I was set up in two minutes. Two I've minutes. Never been Boom. I've never been <laughs> and it was great. I, I, I literally like do, 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 do. and and I literally. Jen's like, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm setting up a telescope." She's like, "That's it." That's so funny. <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, that's I, it." I, my AVX. If I have my like 70 millimeter on my AVX. I can kind of strong arm the whole thing if I had to, but it's like, I got to go and then stop a little bit, then go and then stop a little bit, they go and then stop a little bit. But that's the best I got. I cannot do that with the Skywatcher. Um, I think one time when I first set it up, um, I had my son help me because I was like, I am not going to deck this whole thing back up. I'm like, I got everything. It's all set up. Let's just carry this into the shed. And I got my son to come help me. And, but the two of us are just like, oh. So I think it was like a month after that, I got a telegizmo. So. Nice. Yeah. The key that's pretty interesting with these harmonic drive mounts is, is that, you know, look at what your budget is and then look at the features benefits of all of these harmonic drives. And I think, Dan, you did the best thing is, is that you'd mention all the ones that are available and you literally need to figure out, OK, what are the most features benefits that I get for the bang for the dollar that I want to spend on? Yep. And so you're absolutely right. Is this that um, case in point now, like the rainbow, the RST 135 now has encoders on the R8. They don't have it yet on the RST 300, but I'm sure that's going to happen here in the next six to eight months they'll have probably encoders on the ra and the deck so for that portability aspect how do you beat that and i mean you're right i mean it's it's amazing and, and one of the features that i always will recommend is is get one that has a break you definitely want one with a break if you ever lose power because man that'll be a nightmare if you don't get a harmonic drive mount that doesn't have a break yeah <laughs> yeah, you you will all of a sudden. It won't happen tonight. It won't happen tomorrow. But when you least expect it, bam. Yeah. And then you're told about buy buy thrice, cry thrice. <laughs> that's a, you know that's a, that's what you're gonna have. But um, hey, you know you know I have you know this is gonna be my this is gonna be my mount that's gonna be coming with me to Cherry Springs and all the other places. This is the mount that's coming with me. You know yep. what I mean? I don't have to carry my EQ8R around or my EQ6R around and, you know, set these things. I mean, it's 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 a lot. The, the EQ6R might come with me to Valentine when I go to Nebraska this year uh, for the Nebraska Star Party. It might come with me because I might want two setups like I did at Cherry Springs this year. Um, Wait, when's the Nebraska one? The middle of July. Interesting. Okay. I, I my my wife has family out there, um, and so I've never met them. We've been zooming since COVID, and I met them on Zoom, and we actually like each other. So we're actually gonna kind of go nice. and hang out. <laughs> so. I, I I ask. I actually I ask because um, my mom and I are going somewhere this summer, and we had thought about going to Utah, and I don't think it's gonna happen because we are gonna be traveling with four Chihuahuas in an RV. Oh no. And no, just the face. Ooh, so, but anyway, yes, yeah, so she loves her. She loves her babies. They don't love me. They might love me, um, seasoned well. Um, but but anyway, like so, instead of going to Utah, I was like, how about we go somewhere a little bit closer? You know, she's like, well, 
you know, where would you want to go? Because I can already see it. I can already see my mom not wanting to leave the dogs and like us go somewhere and her just like, I'll stay with RV. You go and have fun. So of course, in my mind, I'm like, well, then let's just go somewhere where it's dark sky. So I open up the dark sky map and the closest real big area of dark sky is South Dakota and Nebraska. So that's why I ask. (laughs) So I don't know. I like South Dakota. It's pretty. I, I, I've never been there, so I'm not 100. The Badlands sure. are absolutely amazing. They, there's nothing there. There's like nothing else. So, so I'm thinking that. Let's see. So this has a. I don't think you're gonna want to do this, but this has a latitude adjustment all the way up to 90 degrees on there. So. I'd have to look at it to make sure. Um, I'm looking at it to see if there's the limit, but I think you can do it in, let's see, software design, product manual. And, and you know, Dan, maybe with the Pegasus, you can talk about the features benefits and then I'll pull out that RST 300 behind me, talk about that. And you can definitely see once again, there's, there's a lot of, of different features that you get, you know, with the price. Basically, everybody was waiting for the Nick to, uh, Nook to come out. It's really got Nick. some great features. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, the biggest thing is that it's 20 kilograms, no counterweights. So yeah. that's 43 or 44 pounds US. Yep. And holy cow. I mean, I could put anything I want on that thing and not yep. have to carry a counterweight along. I mean, that's kind of awesome. Pretty yeah. cool to me. I mean, I'll take that That's in a second. Um, it's 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 super lightweight. You could use it if you if you just wanted to kind of use it in uh, alt azimuth. You could use it in alt azimuth, just like the uh, AM5 as well. AM5 mm-hmm. does that as well. Um, and how are they, they? Are they pretty price comparable? No. No. Okay. No. The the mix is about a thousand dollars more. Okay. And the AM5 was what around fifteen hundred ninety nine. 1999. Um, okay. I think it's 23 or 2240 with the tripod. Okay. Um, so the same thing with this. This is 2960, if I remember mm-hmm. right. I'm trying to remember the price off the top of my head. 2960 retail um, for the mm-hmm. Pegasus, just the mount head. And the tripod is, I think, 350 for the, but it's, yeah. but it's a carbon fiber tripod. So it weighs nothing. <laughs> You know, so, so Dan, nothing and nothing is still nothing. So. Yeah. so, Dan, what's the length on the saddle there? The only thing I would change on this is I would get a longer saddle. Um, and you so, probably- so the thing that's, and I haven't taken this apart yet. So this doesn't suffer from the the mistake like the I- that the HEM27 did, yeah. where they looped the cables all through here. And there's a USB um, hub in here, or in the back, to be more more correct. It's in the back. Yeah. Here, and I'm curious to do it, but there's only the four hex screws here. So I'm wondering if I could take this off and put an ADM yep. saddle plate on it mm-hmm. and then do exactly what you said. And the thing that's good about this, just like the AM5, it does both. It does Vixen. And Los Mandi. So, so V and D, um, the, the HEM 27 does do V and D, but you literally got to take, in order to switch back and forth, you got to take the whole saddle apart to kind of, I, I have it on my video and you, you'll see it, but this is pretty good for the 127. I certainly hope this works for the 127 because I bought it for the 130. So I'm hoping that it does. The only thing that you're going to need, and you're going to have to be careful with it, and it's different for every setup. It's different for every setup because your flattener may not, you may need extensions. You may, you know, depending on the scope that you have, the 127 I know requires from Explore Scientific those M54 extension tubes. Sometimes you need two depending on the flattener that you have. Um, Yeah. That being said, you are definitely, and I, I got them coming, you're definitely going to want the the peer extension that goes yeah. on here to raise the mount head higher 
So mm -hmm. you have the swing through on those longer scopes. Mm -hmm. Those longer scopes will smash into your tripod legs if you don't, if you're not high enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. So be careful. Do, you know, get the, get the pure extension. If you have a 127, get the pure extension without a doubt. If you have the 102, depending on which one you have, or a 100 or a 91, try it, look it, swing it around, you know, manually, not, <laughs> you know, you know, with the, with the hand controller, hand panel, you can't, there's no clutches on this. So you can't kind of move it around and stuff like that. You have to kind of, it's all, it's all electronically kind of stuck. So, so, so show us the inputs on the back there, Dan. Um, so there is, uh, basically it's got the regular, so I, and I, I want, I'm curious to see, it's got the, the two pin Skywatcher EQ six and eight kind of connector here, uh, way back mm -hmm. when the EQ eight was a lot bigger than this. And they changed it with the newer models to make them both the same because I, I correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, I think the, one of the original EQ eights are where it was uh, 18 volt instead of 12. Yep. Yeah, so so they changed the newer eights, and I have the newer eight, which has the same power plug as EQ six. Because so, so just out of curiosity, then could this mount be powered by a Pegasus? It's a, what's the requirement for amperage? What because you in other words, powered by a peg oh a power box. Yeah, uh, not a power box, but the um, the Eagle. Excuse me, the Eagle. So in other words, could oh, yeah. I actually power this mount with the Eagle? Because the requirement for the amperage isn't going to be that great. No, I think it's three amp if I remember right. Oh my God, that's fantastic! And that's at slew. So, um, let me, I'll just look real. Quick. I mean, that's that's another feature benefit right there in itself. Uh, optional accessory. Uh, and yeah, because on the I, saw, I saw that they have these like, and I can share my. Let's see. Yeah, because the Eagle's got two outputs for three amps, and then two other additional outputs for eight amps. So if you could use one of those outputs to power up this little Nix, that would be phenomenal. Well, here's the great thing about the Eagle 4 and hopefully soon the Eagle 5. Um, you could actually take amperage from the 8 amp, one of your 8 amp kind of nodules that you have, and you could make that 8 a 7 or a 6 amp and take those two freed up amps and make one 3 amp a 5 amp. So what do you need, like a splitter cable? No, it's in software. It's in software then. Interesting. It's in software. You, you're minus one, you add to the other. Okay. And it's pretty That's cool. So, so if you do require a four amp, you know, if you're slewing at four amps and it just, you know, it craps out and you need five, you could take one away from one and add it to another. Just as long as you don't, you can't, well, it won't let you, but as long as you don't uh, exceed the max amp draw of the board. It will shut down if you, if you do. Yeah. Interesting. No, no, no through mount cabling, yeah. although there is a nice little space in here where you can kind of go through. Um, I don't yeah. know if I would do that, though, to be honest with you, to feed cables through here. Not sure if mm -hmm. I would do that. So, Dan, uh, the second layer of, of ports there, is it like an, uh, a guider port, a PC port? And so you got, you got your regular um, printer cable USB-A uh, PC port here. You have mm -hmm. a, uh, right here, your regular RJ, what is it, 12, um, yep. SD4 kind of port. It says external. I can't imagine using that for much of anything, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and then you got uh, power in and a power out so you can power okay. things through here so interesting okay. See, that's a great feature and benefit it's it's amazing for a first generation harmonic drive mount they did a very good job on that unbelievable but this is the first one out the gate yeah i'm just hoping so say, i'm just hoping that it performs the way i'm touting this thing because if this thing sucks <laughs> i'm gonna I, I, i'm gonna I, I'll, sell, I'll sell it back to jeff i swear because I, you know I, I mean i don't expect that to be honest with you i've been hearing a lot of good things on cloudy nights so uh yes. i'm expecting it to run really well so yeah you know and so when we start talking then that that's the harmonic drive bounce and then people talk about well what about fork mounts and i was going to say fork mounts do have great potential but 
it really depends upon the scope that you've got. If you've got your camera assembly on the back of your scope, when that target is close to zenith, you're going to bottom out on the fork mount. But with plane wave, it's really interesting is what they've done is on their fork mounts where they have the 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 um, connectors on the side, mm -hmm. what you do is you reach inside the truss tube and then you just turn the truss tube and there's the mirror. And what will happen is the mirror now will actually reflect out through the side. So now you don't put your camera on the back of the, say, CDK scope. You put your camera on the side of the mount that's connected on the pivot points. You can use both pivot points now for your camera assemblies. So they've done a great job on that to be able to overcome that idea of fork mounts when your target is close to zenith. Yeah. That's always been the big issue with the Meads and the Celestrons with the fork mounts. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I got I got a lot of people. I, you know, a lot of people get the fork mounts. I got I got a friend that I'm working with right now. A uh, was it the the not LX two hundred? Was it the LX six hundred twenty inch? The twenty inch. Yeah, it's a big, yeah. and it's a mess. This thing is a mess. I mean, it's just, I'm, it's, 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 it's such a shame that this thing is just so bad. The collimating rods don't work. The hand control is busted. I mean, you know, so you can't cut. So those of you that know, don't know the LX 600, you actually have to column. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a Schmidt pretty much. And it's a big Schmidt. It's an RCX. So it's huge, but you collimate it through the hand controller. And the really? guy's wondering why I can't get in focus and he can't collimate. So, I mean, you know, so I'm like, it's, it's been sitting in a dome for, for years and you can't do anything with it. And it's just, it's just so, I, I got, I got to do, I don't even know what I'm going to do with it yet. I'm still, I'm still playing with it. It's out in Montauk. So. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but yeah, as I said, you know, when it comes to mounts, there's so many new, um, companies that are coming out with these mounts. And so it really depends upon, do you want a remote observatory? Do you want a fork mount? Do you want a harmonic drive mount? I mean, once again, it's just a matter of, of just deciding what you want to do uh, and where you want to actually put it. And, uh, but but it, it really is truly the golden age of, of what we do here. I mean, when we start looking at, especially mounts, because you know, for astrophotography, Mounts are the most important component part that you want to get. And for that matter, you know, we, we literally can, well, you know what, we'll wait until Eric talks. And I'm sure Eric will be talking about tracking and tracking rates. So we won't get uh, down that road yet. No, yeah. I, I mean, I, I haven't seen him pop on yet. <laughs> so I hope he's okay. Yeah. And uh, that's fine. We can keep on going. But there's a couple other things. Like, you know, we sit there and we talk and, you know, a lot of us, do here we do astrophotography right mm. and hey guys oh we were just there talking he is. about you there <laughs> he is down let me uh let me get you up here sorry so sorry no no all good all good, all good. Oh, yeah. let's see not crazy uh let's see what we got here yes, Eric. And... hey everybody yeah. how you doing, doing? <laughs> Good, 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 good. There he is. There you go. Wow. You're right, bro. It is cold. Hey, right hey hold what, it. What, Look, what, what, what is different? What is different? The Christmas tree is covered up. That's, it that's is. why Eric is late. He's <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, oh, is it down crazy. or is it just hiding behind the green screen? It's just behind. When's when's your son coming home? Uh, it looks like in two weeks. Two weeks. Nice. Two weeks. I want my two dollars. I want my two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, well, man! We, we actually craziness. started the conversation a little bit, Eric. Um, yeah, I was. Honest. We didn't actually, want to steal a lot of your thunder. Um, no, appreciate that. You know, but uh, we, we spoke a little bit about the, you know, the mix that I have and the little difference between, you know, you know, like the, 
EQ six R and and the uh, mm. Nix mount. You know what's the benefits of one and the other, but um, yeah, um, we you're can, more we than can welcome to, to this. take the show on and uh, do your thing. Yeah, no, appreciate it, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, apologies for my tardiness. There's no uh, apologies, man. You're we are good. We are we are getting there. So yeah, let's um. Let's bring this up here and let me get to here. And let me go. I want to make sure I'm sharing everything. Put my screen sharing entire window. Chrome tab. No, touch me. Okay. Oh, look at it. Oh, he went all out. Oh, hold on. Oh, wow. He actually, he actually put some time into this. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I put a little bit of time in this one, guys. I put a little bit of time into this one. So um, hearing what you guys were talking I just heard like the first, um, the, last, the last couple minutes of the conversation that you guys were having. So, yeah, we're going to have a bit of a chat on what I consider the core of a great astro image and this is the this is ap 101 guys this is astrophotography 101 and this is all about the mount so let's go ahead and get get right into it and if you guys have any questions if any questions come through the chat guys let me know okay yeah you know what i'll do it and, and you're seeing the live right uh no i'm actually i can only see my screen right now i can only right, see yeah, my that, that's the live but tell me yeah. if you see this uh no i don't see anything i just see my presentation oh, okay all right so it's just coming on mine okay so so yeah. I'll, I'll i'll tell you if there's any questions coming across all right cool cool all right so let's jump into this and the biggest question is you know when you get into this and the reason you get into this is so you want a great astro image and you love the night sky you love everything as far as taking these great photos or seeing these great photos of these deep sky objects and beautiful stars like in astronomy and sky telescope scope magazine you know on facebook instagram you know you go to the apod website all of this stuff and if you're new to this you know you say yeah i want to take the dive i want to take the plunge so I understand because this was me and this, I know it's a lot of people like me and my, you know, getting started. You're anxious, you're excited, but the, I wish somebody would have told me a few things. And so I'm going to share what these, my thoughts are on here. Before you go out and you spend that hard earned money of yours on the telescope and the camera and everything else at ASI air, a dew heater, Filter wheel, filters, you name it. There's one very important question you have to ask yourself about anything else. What mount is my stuff going to sit on? What mount is my telescope going to sit on? Because the mount is the alpha and omega. It is the beginning of the end and the end of a great astro image. So it has to be, in my opinion, and it should be your first and most invested piece of equipment, right? So we're going to talk about, you know, um, one of the most common mounts that we use in natural photography, which is the GEM, the German equatorial mount or that style, or that equatorial mount. So we're going to talk a little bit about the principles, you know, the different types. We're going to talk a little bit about vocabulary, everything, hopefully as much as possible. So if you're new to this or even if you aren't new and you're just uh, you want a little refresher, you can come away with a little bit of knowledge, you know, so you can make a choice on what is going to be that core to your astral photography rig. OK, so first and foremost. You have the equatorial mount. And the question is, what, if you don't know, you really want to know, what does it do? What does it do for me? Why do I need to get an equatorial mount? Right? So the purpose of an equatorial mount, or we call it, we're going to call it EQ, is to track the objects that you want to photograph, those stars or deep sky objects. You want to track them and keep them centered 
throughout the night with a high degree of accuracy. Now, this is achieved by moving that by the mountain moving at the opposite rate that the actual earth moves okay it spins you know how the earth spins the act the, your mount actually spinning moving the opposite way or slewing the opposite way and based on how well you perform the proper balance the proper alignment of that mount these are going to be key points and key things you're going to need to make sure of to get that high degree of accuracy for tracking, okay? Because that was one of the big key things, is tracking. And we track, when you're tracking DSOs, you're tracking in the sidereal, okay? So you want not only to keep this object that you're, oh, that you're photographing centered, you know, as it rotates, as it rotates, you want to keep it centered for as long as you possibly can and do it well, okay? You want, and you want to keep it rotating along that natural arc that the sky moves and that object moves over several hours, over many hours. So with proper alignment and proper balance, you the goal, the main thing is that you can take ultra long exposures of the night sky and that way you can be able to start exposing those details of those faint, of those really faint nebulae and the galaxies and everything you want to look at in space. Okay, so as we as we see here, I don't know, you have this mount here with this um, this old school EQ mount, and you have this North Celestial Pole, and you can see here a little bit of all right. I'm facing north here. I've got south here, east, west, east, and west here. Now we should now if you're not sure, but I'm, I'm going to talk to you guys like as if you don't know. When stars rise, just like the sun, they rise in the east, okay, and they go across the southern sky. In our hemisphere, they go across the southern part of the sky, and they set in the west. That is how it works um, for us here in the northern hemisphere. We, uh, everything rises in the east and sets in the west. And there's we line up um, with our, you know, north celestial pole. All right, so we're going to hop into that here really quick. So how does it operate? Um, let's, oops, sorry, I got to go back here. Sorry, this, um, now, darn it, this is, that was <laughs> not what I wanted to do. Um, here, let me give a sec here, because this is all up in my way. This is poor. I thought I had this all set. All right. Let's get like back in. Filter, uh, presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, how does it operate? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the celestial sphere coordinates, equatorial, right ascension, and declination. Now, every celestial object, stars, DSOs, comets, whatever, whatever is in that celestial sphere, this, you know, in the night sky, it has two numbers that make up its quote unquote address, okay? It looks like we have our home address, it makes up its address. And those are what we call the celestial coordinates. And these are defined by the projection of the, by the Earth's projection, I mean, the, the, or the projection of the Earth's pole and the equator onto the celestial field, sphere, right? So you have your celestial poles, your North Pole, okay? And your South, and your South Pole, right? Your celestial South Pole. Um, and these what and this is how the road um, and off of the pole is how the earth rotates, you know, it's, it's it, you know, rotates on its on its axis. And then you have the celestial equator. Right. Which is right here. Um, it's right here. OK. Now, there are a couple of things, a couple of terms that we need to know about. You have declination. OK, which is the angular distance from the equator either north or south and it's and it's marked as either positive and a positive number when it's going when you're in the northern hemisphere and when you're south of the equator it's negative okay and the right ascension is that angular distance along um circles parallel okay to the equator so the zero point because i was kind of curious about this was where's the zero point 
of right ascension. And sometimes you have you have to think of this um, when you look at this um, right ascension, like kind of it's like a celestial clock, right? So zero, all right, the zero point is at the vernal equinox. So every spring, right, when we when at the start of spring, um, when the, when the sun rises, that point right? That is zero hour. Okay. Um, and that is, you know, where the sun's position in the sky crosses the celestial equator as it moves north. And right ascension actually goes eastward. So if we were looking at this, or if you're thinking about this on a map or like a map, Right ascension and declination are to the celestial sphere what lat what longitude and latitude are to a map in the or in Earth's coordinates. Okay, so that's how it operates. It operates based off of how it is positioned, how it based off of the Earth's rotation and the Earth's and the equatorial right ascension and declination. So the actual mount, it moves, it has two axes, right? Actually, it has three, but it, it moves both the declination and the right ascension axes. And you have your right ascension axes, which is here, which is going up and down, you know, from east to west. And then you have your declination act, uh, movement, which is kind of going from, um, east to west or west to east however you want to how you want to call that so um the so your mount has to be a lot has to be balanced properly on both the declination and the right ascension axes in order to um be, in order to help with um auto guiding that's you know when you're auto guiding and you're um taking these long exposures you know you want to be you know you want to have everything well balanced as well as aligned, and we're gonna talk about here, so here also, to auto guide well, all right? Because you also have the polar axis here, which you um, your polar axis is in line with the celestial pole, right? So, and in many cases, in most, and in all cases, or should be, you will have, um, when you purchase an equatorial mount, um, you will have, the polar axis and it's set in degrees, which is based off of your uh, latitude. And you can actually roughly start polar aligning um, your mount once you first start setting it up based off of your, um, off of your, say your GPS coordinates or your latitude and longitude. So you have like, say me here, I'm at in Illinois, where I'm at, I'm at 44 degrees north. So, when I first start, when I first set up my mount, I initially got the mount set up and initially got it pointing roughly north. And then I set my polar axis up towards at 44 degrees just to get started before I really got into the polar alignment. Eric, so you align. Eric, so you alignment. Got, you got a question yeah. real quick. Um, yeah. Um, about being level with the mount. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, but, yes, right. but yes, well, but yes, but but real quick, that is a that is going to be one of the notes we really want to talk about. You want to make sure that you are setting up your mount, okay, on a as much of a I would say solid or firm surface as possible. I don't necessarily mean you know. It has to be totally flat or anything like that. It should be, but it should be relatively flat, relatively level. Uh, but you also want to be able to, when you put those legs down on that tripod and say, in my, you know, when I first got started, I had it in the backyard and you put it in the grass. But what happens if it rains that, you know, your mount and you leave your mount outside, what happens? Your mount will begin to sink. Those legs begin to sink into that mud or into that grass. You don't want that. You want to be able, you want to get like say patio pavers, nice concrete pavers, anything like, and put that on and make them and put them out and put them on, on the grass 
and make it as level as you possibly can for each of those and then put the legs of your mount on that. You want to keep it on a much of, you want to keep it on a solid surface surface as much as possible. Okay. So um so getting back to here um and how it operates, the mount operates what one of the key things is alignment to the celestial pole. We always talk about polar alignment. Right. Even if you like with my ASI Air or nowadays with plate solving anything else, um, that's all great. But no matter what, because you don't necessarily have to do the three star alignment or anything like that, like we used to do. But the key thing is the pole with uh, plate solving. But the key thing is above all of that is polar alignment. You must be aligned to the celestial pole. That is key. So with these modern go with the modern go-to mounts, you know, in this technology, you know, these equatorial mounts, they have the ability, as long as you are aligned up and you are um, in, in proper balance, they have the ability to, to act to be as accurate, to be very, very accurate when they're slew to thousands of objects in the night sky. Because we all know that these nowadays these mounts they are pretty smart, especially with, with these computerized mounts. They that are that are you know have different types of systems in them. GP they have a GPS encoded Wi-Fi USB. It has all these really cool things. But beyond all that, the very basic stuff is you have to be polar aligned and you should be properly balanced. Those are the most basic things you need. OK, when it comes to that mount, making sure those things are done when you're when you're first setting up that mount. So. We got different choices of equatorial mounts and um, and like I was saying, this is this is a huge investment, probably your most significant investment, you know, when you're getting an actual photography and when you're trying to decide on that on that mount, that first mount. Um, or even your second mount or third mount or whatever, there are certain things you want to consider. And a, none of these things should necessarily be taken lightly. So we're going to talk really we're going to talk a little bit about payload capacity and saddles, right? So now payload capacity, that is the that is defined as the maximum weight that a mount can carry. That means your telescope, your camera, all the accessories, everything, and still perform as expected. Now, with astrophotography, for the best performance or to do, you know, for your to have your mount perform as best as best as it can, there is this unwritten rule of thumb, you know, but it's basically a rule of thumb not to exceed half the maximum payload of the mount. And this is really true when we talk about the um, your intro, your really your budget friendly, just getting started mounts. Um, that may be lower cost in, in that in that thing. You want to make sure that you are purchasing the right mount, and that mount is going to one be able to carry what you want it to carry. But remember, if you're taking images, you've got to you got to take that maximum mount number and slice it in half, and that is going to be your payload capacity. For you know, for the for the equipment you are putting onto that mount. So, Eric, I got a couple of people uh, pushing back on that payload uh, percentage, <laughs> but um, um, now something. Okay. Like, I, I was just wondering if um, through the, your research on here, and I don't know, mm -hmm. if you get, I don't know if you get into this a little bit later on, but I, it's something that was yeah. brought up before you came on. Um, does that rule of thumb change when you're dealing with mounts of different types, for example? Yes. For example, mm -hmm. harmonic versus worm gear. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I believe it does. And this is, the, this, this definition, especially nowadays, this is circumspect to especially today's mounts. But, um, because you do have these different types of mounts now that, yeah, you can load them up, you can load them up to their max payload, 
and you can um, and you can and you can perform just fine. This is why I also said down here, this is especially true for those lower cost mounts. Right. Yep. Um, because yep. a lot of those lower cost mounts, for example, my AVX, my Celestron Advanced VX mount, it is a worm gear mount. That type of these, those, this particular type of mount, you wouldn't want to, I, you wouldn't necessarily want to exceed the max that, that half, that 50% of the max payload. Yeah. I mean, and also like, I, you know, I got a couple people, uh, talking about this in the chat about the EQ6 mm -hmm. yarn and, um, uh, you know, I got I got to agree with them. I I overloaded my EQ six R. I mean, it's forty four pound weight capacity, um, and my EQ six R loves to work hard. <laughs> it does. Yeah. And, and 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 that could be because it is belt driven as opposed to the AVX being uh, worm gear driven. Uh, mm -hmm. But I put about thirty seven pounds on that thing, and my guiding was outstanding on a 44 so so it really you know it, it, and, and i'm not trying to take away from your 50 percent kind of thing because i think you're right with the lower and not i don't want to say lower end but with less price to me becomes less accurate and mm -hmm. yeah that i would have to agree with you where the the percentage of pay payload gets smaller the less you pay for the mount <laughs> so yeah so yeah. So, you, you know, you get an Avalon, you could go all the way up to 105% and have no backlash, whereas you spend $800 on an AVX and you may only be able to put 17 pounds on it on a 30-pound capacity mount. So, right. I mean, that's just something to think about. I just wanted to let everybody kind of... No, know. yeah, and that's, and that's absolutely right. You know, a lot of this, um, and you and everybody's bringing up some really great points. A lot of the this info, uh, maybe some of this information that I am sharing is going to be almost moot in a or not applicable very soon. If not, you know, we get to that point that yeah, some of these um, mounts, they even these you know smaller mounts harmonic drive and everything. Yeah, they, they are workhorses and they are solid. But if we're talking the truer, these these really low cost mounts, um, let me again, like, like you have the older or, um, Orion mounts. Um, and, you know, like I said, my AVX or um, maybe like the HEQ5, things like uh, mounts such as those. Um, or along those lines, you know, in these budget, you know, in these budget numbers, you, these are things you may want to just be aware of and may consider. Um, it's not always necessarily true, but this has been the rule of thumb. And this is actually, yeah, th you're right, guys. This is actually maybe going a little bit away. Uh, so let's move on. But we can, yep. but so, but definitely consider the payload capacity. You don't want to, don't, don't truly max it out. That's the main thing. Don't max it out. Know what, how much you, you know, once you get an idea of the type of scopes and equipment you want to buy, when you purchase that mount first, before you get everything, you know, everything else, make sure. And as well as, you know, maybe because you want to future proof yourself too, because like I said, these are, this is a very, this is a key investment here. You may start adding on purchasing other equipment in the future, in the near future, maybe new scopes, new cameras and other equipment. You want to make sure that you are getting the right mount and that has the right payload capacity, not just for what you're using right at that very moment, but maybe what you could be using maybe a few years down the road. Okay. Yep. Um, so now the saddle, the saddle is where the telescope dovetail connects. Okay. Where the telescope actually rests and sits on top of the mount. So when you're also selecting a mount, there may be the question of what kind of scopes might you you may need to consider. You might have to consider, you know, when you know sitting on that mount. All right. Now you have lightweight. Some of these lightweight telescopes they have saddles. These I'm sorry. The the telescopes have what we have these smaller Vixen style dovetails, and they're commonly found on beginner on beginner telescopes and beginner equipment. You you would see them on those. But you also have the D style, the Los Mandi, which um can which are much wider, and they are more known to be on larger and heavier telescopes. 
Now, some mounts, um, you can also upgrade after, you know, maybe after initial purchase or what have you, you can actually upgrade your mount, your mount saddle to the Los Mondi Vixen style the, or the DV style, um, which would give you a lot more, which would give you that flexibility that you're looking for. Um, and this again, like we're talking about maybe future proofing or anything like that. So you have that flexibility of being able to not only, you know, um, have Vixen dovetailed telescopes sitting on that mount, but you, now you also have Los Mondi. And just remember, if you want to stay within that payload capacity, that, that recommended payload capacity of the mount, no matter what. So here are a couple of different styles uh, or examples of saddles. And um, just to point these out really quick. So you have, like I said, you have the V style, the Vixen, um, which are much smaller and thinner. And this what looks like what a usual, a, a Vixen style saddle would look like. You have your Los Mondi or D style um, dovetail, which you can see here is much wider. Um, same thing with the saddle here, because it's able to, these are able to carry um, much heavier um, telescopes as much, you know, so this is, so that's your Los Mondi. And this is what the D style, the DV style looks like. You see, if you look here a little bit, it's a combination. So you can carry both the uh, Vixen style and you can carry Los Mondi style. And personally, I would recommend um, if you're starting to look at your first mount, if you can, um, I would recommend looking for mounts that have that Los Mondi, that, that dual Los Mondi Vixen DV style saddle. Because I I personally believe these are the this is the way things should be period across no matter what budget telescope it is um, this is you want to make this is making sure that you can carry not you know that small refractor but maybe that also that slightly larger um, uh, reflector type of uh, telescope. Now here we go. Now, this is when we, you know, we're talking a little bit about, you know, worm drives, the drive methods. And equatorial mounts, we, they use different types of drives or different types of methods uh, to, um, to track, okay, to slew and move and track your objects in the night sky. Now, they all, you know, they have their pros and cons, each one of them do. Um, but the first one that we're going to talk about is the worm drive and the worm drive it is this type of gear arrangement where you have the worm here um kind of looks you know like a form of, like a screw and it that meshes with that worm at that worm wheel and the worm drives are probably the most common and most used type um until you know now we've got newer things coming out but even say even within the past, say two three years ago, maybe even a little bit late uh, earlier, you know these were the most common type of drive that you would find in a telescope mount, um, and they were they were found in not only you know your budget friendly mounts, but even in your high end tracking mounts. So um, both types. So no matter the so many times the budget. You still ended up, you know, having, you know, a um, a worm drive that would uh, track your that uh, would be inside your mount for tracking. Now, one of the main elements and issues that you know, just because of how it's designed, um, having, you know, you're going to, with these types of gears, you're going to have what they call backlash, and that is basically when. Backlash, you have a little bit of play in between, you know, the teeth of those interlocking gears here. So you have you have a little bit of play there. Now, what can happen is with backlash, you can that those gears can kind of slip a little bit when the motors are engaged. So when it's tracking, uh, wherever you, if you ever notice, like if you're tracking and you're even taking a picture or you're taking an, an exposure, or even in your auto guiding you'll get these little jumps, these little blips in your mount. And that and that little blip can cause um, those stars to appear to have a little bit of a star trail 
especially if you're doing long, long exposures. So, and that's basically, and that is the backlash of those worm gears. So now it can be reduced. Um, one, it can be reduced, um, at least from what I understand, what I've been taught, you know, back in the day, is to balance that, balance your mount slightly heavier on the east, towards the, towards the east side of your mount, okay? Um, you'd be a little east heavy is what they, what they call it. Um, especially when you, when that's when we talk about on the right ascension and on the declination, you are a little camera heavy. Okay. So you're slightly camera heavy. Um, so those, that is what, so that can help deal with backlash. Um, you're never going to get rid of it. It's, it's just the nature of the beast. You, if you have these type, if you have a worm gear, um, a, a worm drive type of, you know, mount that runs on worm gears, you're not. You just have to accept backlash is going to be a part of that of that mount. There's no way around it. Eric, but can I, can I add yeah. one here before you go on? Yeah. Earlier we were talking about the interface of the gear to the worm. Look at the percentage of teeth that's engaged from the worm to the gear itself. Mm -hmm. Look how much you don't get a lot of torque here. That's the difference when we were talking earlier about harmonic drive, is that you're gonna get 30% torque because you can have 30% of the teeth engaged with harmonic drives. But that's always been the one weakness here with the worm and the gear is look at the small percentage of the teeth that are engaged compared to the overall number of teeth. Yes. Eric, I gotta say, yes. I'm loving the visualization here. Um, as Pete was trying to explain it to me, um, I'm surprised I didn't have smoke coming out of my ears just trying to like <laughs> get in my head what he was saying. The vi I'm uh -huh. a visual person. This helps. <laughs> good, good. So as you can see here, I've got two different examples of, of mounts here. And this is the Celestron AVX. This is a budget-friendly mount, and it has worm gears. Now, also here, this is the um, Ioptron CEM120 a much heavier payload a much more what we call observatory grade mount it but it you know it's much more expensive than the avx it's usually about maybe four times as expensive as the avx however even though it's that expensive it also has a worm has worm gears within its within its um declination in ra axes so some manufacturers they design the worms that you know to have um the worms to be spring loaded into mesh you know to help minimize backlash and that's one of the things i know that the uh, cem 120 kind of you know has you know to help minimize that backlash but just keep this in mind that this is the way you know using worm gears has always has been the way for decades when it came to designing and building mounts so if you have that just be aware, you know, backlash is one thing that you all, you're going to always have to end up dealing with until you get a new mount. Now, there's also the drive method of belt, the belt drive. The belt drives are also used, and these are also used in entry level, from entry level up to high end type mounts. Uh, some of these um, drives, they there you, you can even be, have a combination of both belt and worm gear okay and if your belt if you're using exclusively belt drives you usually don't have backlash there's zero you i would say there's zero backlash unlike you know worm drives you know um another thing is with, with um you with a belt you don't have to worry about lubrication versus a worm drive. So it's like say hyper tuning and stuff like that, where you would have to replace, you know, the lubricant and go to super, you know, super lube and all of that stuff. And, you know, to, up to you know, to improve you the, uh, to help with the, you know, to help with your mount in that worm gear. Um, worm drives, you don't have to worry about, not worm drives, but belt drives, you don't have to worry about lubrication. You know, because but they do use timing belts, 
and timing belts do wear, you know, but you have timing belts and you have pulleys and those are what move them out. But one cool thing is that they are actually quieter than, than, than worm gear. You know, if when you hear a worm gear slew and a total belt driven slew, you can tell, you can definitely tell the difference. So um, now here we see, this is the CGX mount, which is um, Celestron's um, top end mount. And you can see here that um, it actually has a combination. It has worm gear as well as belt. So that's not uncommon, especially as you start moving up in certain types of um, brands of mounts and price points that you would see um, combinations such as this. Okay. Um, now, while with a belt drive, um, you know, backlash can be, you know, lowered or eliminated. Um, one thing I believe if you use even with the gear drives, you will, you know, even with gear drives, you will suffer from periodic error. And that is, and periodic error is the measurement of the irregularities in those gears. Okay. So the mounts, you know, they have, they use gear systems that make a complete rotation. All right. And you're measuring that periodic error. For example, my CEM 60, uh, for in order for it, it does a complete rotation. It does it within five, it does it 300 seconds it takes to do that complete rotation. And during that time, we are, it is, um, if you're doing what we call periodic error, um, you can actually begin to train the mount to learn where those imperfections are. And because if you and because this can actually help you know dealing with that periodic error and correcting things and improving that performance of um, of your mount if you take advantage of PEC or that periodic error. Now these are a few examples of belt driven or combination do um, belt driven and worm driven style. Like I said, you have a CGX here. But we talked, you know, you mentioned a little earlier, uh, Dan, the Avalon. The Avalon is all drive. It is all belt. So, and it is zero backlash. And it is, and you pay for it. It's not a cheap mount. It's uh, it's one, it's a great mount. Um, but this is a, and it's a very good performing mount. So this is the Avalon M0. And then you also have the um, DMX Plus from Software Best. And Pete, I believe you have a you have a software bisque, right? You have the Mighty, the Mighty, or do you have the MX? Yeah, and no, that's I belt. My... If I'm not mistaken, correct? That's a belt driven um, mount as well. It's yep. not it's not worm driven. It is it has belts. It's belt driven. Yep. Yep. So you don't have to worry about backlash. Yep. So. Next, we are going to hop over to the latest and greatest, um, the, the harmonic drives, these strain wave drives. Um, these, this is the latest in harmonic, you know, in, in mount technology. So they also use a gear system. We have a flex spline, a circular spline, and the wave generator. Um, but what's really incredible about these harmonic drives, they have much better gears, um, much better quality, and they allow you, they allow you to carry more payload, many times more payload than even the mount itself, how it, even how the mount, you know, the mount's actual weight, right? You don't need counterweights usually, um, and which is makes them really, really um, great as far as portability. They have zero backlash. Um, back in the day when you were first get starting to introduce harmonic drives, you had such um, mounts such as the Rainbow and the Hobum, um, which were really considered, you know, 
you know, really out of reach for, but, you know, as far as, as far as budget friendly, um, but innovation, you know, has really driven down that cost, you know, and for manufacturers to actually get into this game of harmonic and strain wave drive mounts. So you have like the AM5 here um, from ZWO, you have the Pegasus Astro Nix um, going, and you even have Ioptron with its HEM, um, I think it's the 44 and the 25, you know, they're actually getting into the game now like Rainbow and Hobum did in early and they're getting into that market space and people are are scooping up especially the AM5 and they're really getting into the Knicks and stuff like that because they are really budget friendly. So a couple things um we're gonna wrap this so wrapping this up there's a few things that I would say um some some things that I would note out or, or some key points. Placement. When you decide to get your, when you have your mount, prep the surface. Have it as solid and firm of a surface as you possibly can. Um, it's very important because uh, you are going to be polar aligning. And if you're on a wet, soggy surface, unbalanced, um, you know, and poor surface, it's, you know, you're going to have work, you're going to have issues. It's going to sink. It's going to do all those, these bad, the, the, the bad things. It's going to get out of polar alignment constantly. You will not have a very good experience. So remember to just make it, you know, when you decide on your mount and you decide to purchase your mount, also decide on where you're going to set it up. Okay. So that's very important. Polar alignment. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore doing it because this is probably one of the key things you really have to do regardless of plate solving and everything else. You have to polar align your mount and, you and you're gonna have probably polar alignment quite often until you get a peer or anything like that. Um, so it's very important, it's key for tracking, it's key, it's very important for tracking, it's very important for auto guiding, you know, doing those long exposures. And nowadays, I would say within the past three, maybe five years, actually, um, I remember when I first got started, I would break my back trying to pull a line with a polar scope. Huh. I hated it. I absolutely hated it. But technology is at has pole master. Celestron has their all star polar alignment. Uh, you've got Sharp Cap um, Pro. You've got the ASI Air. You've got Nina. You've got so many pieces, so many tools now that are out to do polar alignment because everyone, you know, when you're in natural photography, so many people know how important polar alignment is. So definitely do not ignore it, you know, or else, you know, it's you're gonna you're gonna have problems, especially at the long doing long exposures. Balance. Especially with worm, you know, talking worm drive mounts, balance is key. All right. Um, when you're talking worm drive mounts, be a little slight heavy, slight east heavy, you know, on the RA, be a little heavy on the camera um, side when you're talking declination to engage your gears. Um, when it comes to the newer mounts, um, you the balance you don't really necessarily need to worry about that especially when we talk about the strain wave or the harmonic drives um that is it's still you still have to balance but it's not as imp, it's not as emphasized you know it's not as strongly emphasized as you would be if you were using a worm drive mount um i did talk about payload for astral photography you know 50 percent of the max weight capacity uh, to be allowed by the mount. But to everybody's point, you know, it's very, and it's a very true point. These newer mounts um, and even my center balanced um, uh, CEM 60, you can really push that weight. But this is really, if you're getting started and you're looking at a budget friendly mount, uh, this is one thing you may wanna, you know, just keep in the back of your mind and consider and make sure of. 
Uh, backlash, you know, if you have that dry, you know, that gear driven, that worm driven mount, it's, you're not going to be able to avoid it. It is what it is. It'll never be zero. It'll just be an, one, another annoying thing that you'll have to do or have to accept, you know, and the only literally thing you can, you might be able to do with it is down at the bottom would be kind of like hyper tuning or anything like that, or doing certain things that, you know, maybe feel a little mechanical, um, and, you know, and mechanically um, proficient, you may be able to do a few things, but it's just because of the gears, how it's designed and how it's been engineered. It's just, that's one thing you're just going to have to deal with. And one thing I learned was when it comes to backlash, the right ascension is usually always, is usually much worse than the declination backlash. It just, I'm not, I, it is, that it is what it is. But um, yeah, I just wanted to make, you know, call it out there. Um, Auto guiding, um, we talked about this a little bit. This is what we do to you know to help keep our target centered for those long exposures. It in auto guiding, it sends those signals to the to your mount to help avoid star trailing. So um, when you are we you have your EQ mount, you know you are probably going to end up also having to maybe look into auto guiding, um, depending on your mount and what it can and can't do. Uh, if you like to do visual astronomy as well as um, imaging, it's a little bit. Some of them are a little more expensive than the traditional EQ, either your traditional EQ mount. Because we might want to look at getting a hybrid. You know, um, there there are even nowadays. I think even the AM5 is actually considered can be considered a hybrid um, because it does have an all ass um, mode. So you can um, technically use it for visual astronomy as well as for imaging, but yeah, if you but if you do like to do um, both long exposure astrophotography as well as doing um, you know visual um, astronomy, you this may be a, the type of mount you might want to consider. And if you're just getting started, you know, with um, certain types of alt as mounts, a very good example would be the Celestron Next Star. Um, Telescopes like um, I have the um, eight-inch Nexstar. If you want to get into um, at long exposure astrophotography, but a equatorial mount is not at the in your budget at the at the current time, you might want to consider looking into getting a wedge, um, because with having that using that wedge, you it will you will be able to um, you be able to track on the um, uh, you'll be able to track equatorially and um, you'll be able to um, do those long exposures. So um, if you can't afford just yet the EQ, but you really want to start doing that, this type of photography, this um, long exposure photography, I mean, it may be something you might want to consider. Um, I personally would just say wait and just save you a little bit more money and this just save the money and just when the time comes then go ahead and get an eq mount but if you just can't wait they they do manufacture wedges out there and you can purchase those so and like i said hyper tuning that is that is a technique that is used um to help improve the performance of your mount so if you do have these worm gear mounts um and the tracking and you're tracking or say your the grease seems or it seems to be sticking a lot like my avx was um hyper tuning may be um a service that you may want to send your mount out to have performed and have done to uh, help improve that performance of your mount so um it may be something to consider just just keeping that out there just a point just point that out all right well that is it so appreciate it guys um and yeah uh let's uh keep continue with the questions and everything like that so for sure yeah. uh but nice job not... eric very nice thank job you. with that thank you and, and love the powerpoint and then i'd say i love the visuals i love the visuals that help i mean i know when i pick oh. mine out um when i got my mount when i got my eqr6 um and then i ended up mm -hmm. getting an avx about a year later um just because uh 
long story short, I ended up having to send my um, Skywatcher. I fried the board because I don't know zippity ding dong about electronics. Um, so I ended up frying my board and they, they fixed it for me, but I had the, I had to get the summers off and I ended up frying my board at the beginning of July. So I'm like, oh, okay, I can't wow. buy a new mount. Whole, yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I can't spend a ton of money sending it up in the AVX, but, um, but anyway, yeah. anyway, I mean, I was looking at it more from the price point and, um, you know, you know, going out there onto the interwebs and like, okay, folks, I'm getting, I'm new, I'm getting started at this. And the Skywatcher, the, the EQR6 was the one that just came up over and over and over and over and over, yep. you know? So, you know, and, and, once I chose, <laughs> and I got it. And then, I, then I kind of did the same thing with the AVX. Um, but I, I, and I did not really know the difference between the three different ones. I mean, it's, you know, the, the size, the portability, you know, but as far as the warm, warm gear and the belt driven and the harmonic and whatnot. So that, that was very nice. Yeah. Now I just actually, well, I'm curious, you mentioned the hyper tuning and I've heard people say that. Um, and I'm mm-hmm. just like, you yeah, know, um, scroll. <laughs> what exactly? So, okay. My first question is two part question. First question, what exactly yeah. do they do when they hyper tune it? And two, um, you know, so that's for something with the warm gear. Um, what about belt driven? I mean, I know, okay, let's say a car, you know, has belts, the belts need to be replaced. They need to have maintenance. I mean, are, is there any kind of regular maintenance that somebody that has um, like a belt driven or you know, any telescope or any, any mount would mm-hmm. want to do? Yeah. Well, I can only, as far as hyper tuning, I've had my ABX mount hyper tune. I sent yeah. it to deep space products and had it, and have them do it. Um, yeah, and like a, yeah, like it, a, they're, they're basically. Like a $900 they, mount you had hyper tuned. It cost you $400 I know. to get hyper tuned. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was a newbie. I was a newbie. I hear you. you know, I hear you. It happens. And I, and I mean, you know what? And I hated it, but, you know, how it was performing. So I figured, eh, let me try this. But um, yeah, they, 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 many times they replaced the gears. They can't replace mm-hmm. the gears. Um, they, re- you know, they replace the lubricants and everything like that. Uh, there may be, there's a few other things that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, like on mine, they replace the saddle for me. Um, so it has a, D- a DB saddle on instead of just okay. the old uh, Vixen style. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's 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 a it's an expensive tune-up. It really is. Okay. It's, it's, and, and if you if you know that. In going into um, going into purchasing that mount, that this is one thing you are going to end up having you know, just de- to deal with, and then you learn, especially through um, you can start learning how your mount acts, and you know maybe it also having it learn its periodic errors and things like that. It may be something that you may not need to do. Or if you feel, you know, savvy enough that you feel comfortable enough to take apart your own mount, you know, that's one thing I didn't do. You know, I wasn't very, no. you know, savvy. You I'm know. not, you know, I'm silly enough. I can't say savvy enough to do it, but I'm cheap enough to try it if there's a tutorial. Yeah. <laughs> no, there, there is a tutorial I mean, I'm generally pretty are, good. I can follow instructions. There are you know, it's kind yeah. of hard things. There are, there are instructions out there where you can actually do it yourself. going on there. And, and you know what? And Deep Space Products actually does not do it. I, I actually spoke to, um, yeah. um, what's his name? Um, Ed. Over at Deep, and he doesn't do it anymore. He he tells, sells you the kits now to do it yourself. Yeah, um, do it yourself. But um, I actually w- I got my Atlas EQ done, uh, my EQG done in mm-hmm. April of twenty one, and okay. um, I, the only reason why I started, the only reason why I got it done, I had that EQG for seven years. Okay. And let me tell you something. One of the most underrated mounts out there. I mean, this thing was 40-pound capacity. It was the precursor to the EQ6R. And, you know, it was made by Orion. You know, the EQ6R was white. The Orion stuff was black. That's the only difference was the color. The whole thing was that I started to see some funky stuff with the guiding after a while. You know, and, you know, after seven years, you kind of figure, okay, you know it well. It's either me taking it apart and replacing the gearing, the grease, and the bearings, and all that, or for one hundred fifty dollars shipping and four hundred bucks, I'll have a brand new mount when you come back. Yeah, and sure enough, that's what he did, and he did a great job with mine. I've heard it's kind of either a hit and miss, kind of when you mm-hmm. have it done mm-hmm. in some in some cases. 
but uh, mine turned out really well. And uh, I, I got to say, great job to Deep Space Products, well, at least for my mount. Really good job. And I actually ended up selling my mount close to retail price because of because yeah. of the hyper tuning. You know. Now what? Now what about? So then, my second part of the question was, as far as like belt driven mounts, like the Skywatch, like the EQR six, like is there any kind of like maintenance or anything that should go into those? I guess in my mind, I'm like kind of wondering, oh, you know, it's been sitting under a telegizmo for years. I mean, I do bring it in sometimes, but you know, like, mm -hmm. is there some kind of regular maintenance I should be doing other than just going out and patting it, telling it's a good telescope every so often? You know, that's a good idea. I should try that. Yeah, I do. Yeah, Every time I walk by, I tell it to the cute. amount and give it a little love, give it a little, you know, pat on it. A little, 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 belly, rub, little belly rub, little belly rub, you know, just a little. Exactly. <laughs> a little scratch. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I tell it, you, you, you a good scope. You a good scope. We'll be together again yeah. soon. <laughs> you a good scope. Away soon. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, my my whole thing with maintenance and mounts, and I know as astrophotographers, we all are tinkerers. We're all mm -hmm. tinkerers and we all like to mess things up and take things apart. And I'll be the first one to yes, admit sir. if I don't have extra parts when I'm done taking something apart and putting it back together, I did something wrong. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the whole thing is if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know what I mean? Just, you know what? You, you may be creating a bigger problem by trying to fix and get that one tenth of a guiding point back yeah. when your stars are fine well, not so much fixing it but preventing future problems that i guess is where i you know it's like what you know what should i be doing with this telescope other than you know patting it on the tum tum every so often you know what should i be doing to make sure that you know like is there any kind of regular you know, you're, 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 you know three thousand mile service you know whatever it yeah. is you know? <laughs> so. i mean like like eric said on his presentation you know there are timing belts on the eq6r mm -hmm. that's what time, got me thinking when he said that i was like you know i wonder yeah, no, <laughs> okay. over time yeah. and temperature yeah i think they'll you know eventually i mean i have had a problem i've had my eq6r in and out of cold weather for three years now mm -hmm. Um, and I have not had and still working like the same way it worked day one, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Now, belts do not like temperature fluctuations, they don't like them, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, sooner or later, you will develop cracks, you will develop stretches, you will develop that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you right now, I have not heard of a situation where somebody had to switch out a belt yet, unless if it was a real serious mechanical problem. Well, that is good to yeah. hear. <laughs> I, mean, I know there's some that have been working a lot harder than mine. I mean, I, I don't know if you've heard of anything like that happen. I mean, I'm sure you've heard of it happening, but as far as a a, a, a constant occurrence, I haven't heard of it. Mm -hmm. yeah, basically, have, have you heard? Well, like like the Mighty Mount and the MX Mounts and the MX, the uh, ME2s, it's just basically just relubing annually. And it's a real simple process. Um, okay. Los Vandy mount, my God, the Los Vandy mounts, you can tear those things apart and they're like a Volkswagen. I mean, you can tear <laughs> them apart and put them back together and just lube them up. And uh, they, they're they built like a freaking, like the Bismarck. They're just made to just <laughs> run all the time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when it gets in now to the harmonic drive mounts, well, that's a whole different venue altogether. So, you know. But, but yeah, you know, don't be afraid to do any, you know, yearly maintenance because basically it is just yearly maintenance. You, you know, the idea is, is that if you just, I call it the seven P's, prior proper prevention prevents piss poor performance. If you just do it on an annual basis, you'll have a forever mount and you'll be quite happy with the, uh, the results that it gives you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, let's see not doing worth anything until they start giving you problems like <clears throat> excuse me um but to Pete's uh, point you know if you could do some preventive stuff that'd be great um but uh you know i'll be honest with you i i, I am not that person that's going to take a part amount unless if i have a specific kind of youtube channel that's literally doing because some of these youtube channels out there they say they do something and mm -hmm. they don't do it 100 <laughs> percent 
and you're like, well, I got my stuff all apart here. Now, how do you put it back together? I Wait, think are that, you saying there's there's information out on the internet, Dan? No, not at all. No, not, no I would <laughs> say that. Absolutely not. No, I would not say that. But uh, hey, you, you know what? I mean, there there is a lot of great information out there. You know, there are a lot of people that take these things apart and and do wonderful things with them. I am not one of those people. I will I will call my buddy DB out in the chat. I'll be DB. I need your hands. I need your help. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to take this thing apart for me. <laughs> I am not a mechanical engineer. I will screw something up. I, computers, no problem. Anything with gears, forget it. Computers, put together, <laughs> take apart, take apart disk drives, take apart hard drives, whatever. Don't give me anything with like a timing gear or belt or anything. I will totally mess it up. Nope, not going to happen. <laughs> That happened. No, nope. yeah, I'm kind of the same way, man. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, know my limitations. Yeah, <laughs> know your limitations. I mean, I know how to change. I know how to change oil in my truck. I know how to replace yep. the spark plug. Yep. I know, you know, how to do certain things around my truck. But mm -hmm. yeah, when it comes to dealing with the belts or anything like nope. that, or anything that if I know my limit, like Dan says, I know my limitations too. And I'd say, you know what? I'd rather pay someone. Who has yep. been trained to do this stuff? Yep. Then with then myself, screw it up. But, and, yep, screw it up. Now you're down. Uh, you know. I a wish I could say I was that smart. <laughs> yeah. Because I'll get in there and I'll start tearing it apart, and then I'll be like sending pictures to somebody and be like, "Yo." <laughs> well, do, do yourself a favor. If you're gonna do that, it's okay to do that, but have a backup. <laughs> So yeah. have a second mount so you're not out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Have a second mount so you're not that's out. That's what I've got the AVX you know. now. And, you know, I'm kind of, you know, again, I, let's say I have yeah. great ideas. I do. But, you know, actually, will I ever, ever, ever try to hypertune my AVX on my own? Probably not. I don't know. Well, the yeah. will probably be a Take good it apart. To Try to because, figure it out you know, and put it back together it's later. A super, super bad kind of expensive loss as like, let's say, taking apart a rainbow that it's like $1,000. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> if I had the money, if I had the money for one of those, I've got the money to pay somebody to do it. I don't have the money for one of those. I, got you. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Well, we got, you got, everybody's got four minutes left to vote. For picture of the week, so everyone's got. Oh I'm not going to forget this week, and I'm not going to say Eric. I'm not going to let Eric get get his, uh, you know, get his word in saying, "Dan, you forgot the picture of the week." So I'm not forgetting it this time. <laughs> so oh. we got four minutes. And 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 hold on, I see 43 people watching right now, and we've only got 29 likes. 30, y'all. 30. What? Excuse me. 30. Mash that like oh, button. Yeah. Mash you know that like button. Pete, you you're on two YouTube accounts. You only hit the button once. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm, kidding. I'm trying to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's like, vote IC443. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, so HyperTune as a service, and you, like we said on the show, it used to be deep sky product, uh, uh, deep space products. Um, deep space products. Unfortunately, he no longer does it. He just sells the kits. Um, I don't know. I I want to say Star Arizona might do it. Is that today? I don't know if they do it anymore. I know they. I don't know if they do it or not. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know if they do it or not. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, th I think that it's all on your own at this point. I don't know anybody else that does it, to be honest with you. Deep, Sp Deep Space Products was the ones that were the go-to people as far as hypertuning is concerned for a long time. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he no longer does it. So yeah. Dan's Fix-It Shop. Yeah, you know what? You know what? You know what? Yeah, and I just hired someone. His name is DB. He'll do it for you. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no one stars on it. Thanks, Jay. No one stars on it. So, yeah. I, 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 don't, I really don't know. Deep Space Products is the only one that I've known that actually does it. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we'll all have to kind of look that up. I, I, don't, I don't know anybody else that does it. So, 
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put DB in the closet of death with Jesse's AVX, and he's gonna hyper tune it in the closet of death. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and if you have seen DB, you nobody's ever seen DB. DB's bigger than Eric, so DB's not fitting in my closet of death. <laughs> so that guy's, <laughs> but. <laughs> I'll fix any hey. amount, any size for 19.95. He's like the slap chop guy. Oh wait a minute, that's my Schwab. My Schwab. You're gonna love my nuts. <laughs> I'll fix any car for 19.95. <laughs> All right, one minute left for the picture of the week. The one minute left. Get your last votes in. Oh, you can't. Uh, it's it's actually closed. It's closed. Forget okay. So let's go. DB is Earl Shine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's check out. Let's check it out. Let's check out the picture of the week. So here we go. Let's get it on the Some screen. Choices. And I did some switches to the screen. And unfortunately, Jesse, I got to put you in there because I only had it set for four, set for three. So give me a second. Oh, okay. Yeah, I kind of did. No, that's okay. It's all good. Yeah, now. I feel like every other Friday seems to be to be working well for me. You know, that that that's where in I was gonna message you this first thing this morning and be like, I'm gonna be on. Just so I like like I'm committed. Once I like tell you I'm gonna be on, I'm gonna be on. So, so I need to do on Friday mornings, just shoot you a message, be like I'm coming on. And I'm gonna do that and I'll do that. And there you go. So now you're on. All right. So so let's do uh Oh, sorry. I, I was I was watching the Islander game. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go, go Islanders. Uh huh. That's Islanders how it win. is, man. They beat, they beat Pittsburgh, and my Brock Nelson. God, I can't stand him. He scores his twenty fourth goal. Had second hat trick. Horrible. I can't. I, I trade that guy, will you? Just trade him anyway. Um. So let's go to. Astro World Web. And so for you newbies out there that don't know our website, our website is astroworldweb.com. And you go literally right onto the where it says image contest, and you can see the images that are up for picture of the week. Our last week's picture of the week is up from February 10th. Uh, that was Bloodstone with M81. And he told me that these little streaks here, these bloody eye kind of things. That's his trademark. And if you, you've seen his, his Leo Trio, he has a bloody eye in that too. So, I mean, okay. he's got, he's got what, you, know the, you know, in the Leo Trio, it has a little um, spiral galaxy on the bottom. On It has a hamburger galaxy and the spiral. That spiral galaxy has some bloody eye in it too. So, he's like, he's like that's nice. what I do. But, so, it won't be called the black eye galaxy. It'll be called the bloody eye galaxy. Right? There you go. That, that's yeah. what it is. And if you want to import anything into our Google Drive and enter your pictures in for a picture of the week, all you got to do is hit the Google Drive, and then you drop it in there. As you can see, there's nothing there right now because they're all up. So there you go. So the pictures of the week, here we go. First one, Tom Peters Rosette. Second one. AZ4 runner's horse head and a little bit of the flame. Mm -hmm. Tom Peters, M45. Oh, I like three. that. And mm -hmm. an upside down monkey's head by Billy Beckett. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting he, on my head. I guess I'm sitting on my head. <laughs> I guess that's, you know, no up and down in space, though. So I guess that's kind of relative. So then we got M78. And I the don't. The Boogeyman. I don't know who that is. No name. Then we got uh, IC443, Dave Schaefer, Mr. Capitals. Big Capital fan, Dave. And then Josh Kovacs uh, revamp of his uh, Lagoon and Triffid. Okay. And another horse head in flame by Kevin Rosso. Kevin. Kevin nice. Rosso. Yep. Very nice, guys. So it's eighty-four 
We got 84 votes. And Dave Barnett is <laughs> texting me. Come on over. All right. So uh so here we go. So let's go in and let's take a look and see who won. Cause it was kind of let's see, there's Abbott. And let's see what we got here. You you can't see my password anyway, it doesn't matter. And and we also got to give away a free uh, Masters of Pink's Insight workshop tonight, too. So i do that. All right, here we go. So image of the week ending February 17th. Let's see the results. 84 <laughs> votes. One more vote than last week. So let's see for next week. if we Those numbers are jumping up, though. Yeah, 99, mm -hmm. 95, 44, Nice. And I got, I got, yeah. give, and I know thank you guys. We really appreciate that. Yeah, I know, I know. I got, I got to give a shout out to Dylan uh, Bloodstone. Um, he's been retweeting our tweets, and he's got a lot of followers on Twitter, and he has been really driving a lot of these votes. Um, but uh, hey, you know what? It's pretty cool that we're getting this type of recognition. So mm -hmm. here we go. Results. Here we go. And Tom Peters, M45. M45. With, with uh, just about half the votes there. 50, a little bit more, 53% of the votes. So uh, Congratulations, nice job, Tom. Tom Peters. Sorry, Dave. Capitals lose again. But um, Tom, nice job. And uh, you'll be in the running for uh, the February picture of the month so congratulations awesome. great image congrats really good image really good image. I, lo I love yeah, it was that was a that was a lot of detail in that the i really like that all <laughs> over the place was great yeah pretty pretty unbelievable yes. nice job and then we got to do uh we got to do the, the uh dan? yeah dan go go back to the specs on that please you got to look at this look at the specs 144 subs at five, five minutes, minutes each. Yep. How many hours is that? Look, do, do the calculations on that. So that's, that's uh, five, that's 720 minutes. <laughs> so that's yep. what? You know, 720 20. divided by 60, right? Yeah, so that's... Uh, it's 12 hours. 12 hours. But look at the detail. Look at the detail. Yeah. Look at Merope. Look at Merope. I mean, he's really got the, the nebulosity around Merope. I mean, we really should look at this image because it is a beautiful, yeah, beautiful back image. Up again. There it is. I, I, I love mean, that, it. I really do. Yeah. I mean, that is... Yeah, I just love the wispy, the wispy. I don't know what is there a term for those little wisp the, the little wispy tendrils there? Yes, um, it's, it's it's wispy tendrils. Hey, hey, hey I got it. <laughs> I was good. I was I was all prepared to write it next down to my on my nose. I'm taking my notes right next to the box globules. I remembered that. I still can't pronounce it, but I remembered it. You, you know what I really love <laughs> but, about this photo though, and I wish I could zoom in a little bit more on the web. I I could do it on the other one, but he's got this detail in here. Yes, that's unbelievable here. And you know what the coolest thing about this entire picture to me is? This star. Right here. That's the one red star and the whole thing. Everything yeah. else is almost blue with the exception of a couple of stars. But this one's nice and bright. And um, But you know what is that, that I, I do like about this? Not just, you know... It, it's how well the seven sisters are not overpowering. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're they're not overpowering because that those are some bright freaking stars. And well, so often this you and see he's got it very, very well managed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so often, Eric, you see, like, when every time I see M45, I mean, more, I'm sure I probably have, maybe, but just don't recall it. Uh, maybe it's not just been, like, right in my face, but I don't see that, that those wispy tendrils, you know, because I think, you know, the, the Seven Sisters just, just kind of, you know, um, overpower the image. 
you know, um, I don't, listen, um, you know, I can look at a hundred of the hundred M45 and just not see that detail. And yeah, yeah you didn't see, really get know. Yeah. <laughs> see here, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an example real quick. I have to share my screen because this is, this is what I'm talking about. Why I like this image a lot. Right. Um, so there's mine. Mm -hmm. You see how bright and overpowering those mm -hmm. stars are? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and you can't you can kind of see you can see what's supposed to be under there, but just trying to tame those stars so and you can trying actually to tame get those stuff. stars. Now, yes. you know, yeah, that's that's why I personally voted I voted for that for for that image myself because I thought it was just great. I really mm -hmm. did. You brought up a good point, Eric, is, is that the stars don't overpower. But you know what's interesting? What I find interesting on this image is look at the linear lines. There's diagonal lines. There's horizontal lines. There's vertical mm -hmm. lines. Look at the detail that shows you the detail that's been pulled out of this. I mean, this is really a good image to show you pulling out the details. It, it is. Dan, can you pull up one more time? I uh, yeah, just. Give me one second here. And yeah, see, Chris is even asking, how do you get five minute subs on that bright of a star? On that bright of that on that, on that star cluster, how bright it is. Uh, he's also using a, a 6200. Ah, deep well. Yeah, <laughs> huge well. Huge well. Uh, he's only yeah. pinned it one by one, and we still don't know what kind of uh Tom, if you're there. I know you were there before. But if you could tell us what portal sky you're in as well, that'd be uh, really interesting to know. Because what I've read about this this young star cluster is that they're moving together as a cluster, but they're going through this arm within the Milky Way that there's a lot of nebulosity. And so the star's mm -hmm. luminosity is reflecting this luminosity. But I mean, the transition from the blue nebulosity on the east side or the right side, you notice it goes mm -hmm. from the blue mm -hmm. to the shading. I mean, look right. at that detail. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is a very, very good image. Very good image, Tom. And this, you know what? And you may, and you brought up, and, um, and in the chat, they brought up a very good point the well depth using that yeah. 6200. That this is when we talk about, you know, certain pieces of equipment like our kid, like these dedicated cameras that well depth because my shot that I took was with the 533. Yeah. Right. And that and that that's like nothing. That well depth is nothing compared, compared to the compared 62. To well, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And mine, I took. Mine was almost 40. Mine was just almost 40 300 second shots. And he had what over a hundred? Yep. That's this is what we, you know, when we talk about the, the equipment we use. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. We'll be discussing that next week. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be our topic, so that'll be a perfect segue. Just copying the new names, putting it in the all right, we're, all right, here we go. So we're almost at 150 members on the Masters of Pix Insight Wheel. We have 149. I gotta save it. <laughs> all right, so this is for the free Masters of Pix Insight workshop. Uh, next one is Masks Unmasked. I believe it's on the 17th of March, a month from today. Um, if I let's see if I'm right on that. I think it's uh, March. Uh, sorry, March 21st. My fault. But here we go. And if you don't like that, you don't want to learn about masks. You can do whatever you want. You can get whatever one you want. So you want WVPP, you want uh, dialing them down the noise, or you know whatever it is, you can get whatever you want. So here we go. Number one. No whammies, no whammies. Stop. 
Oh man, almost almost a protostar winner won Brian Boerma, but you didn't win this time. Kevin Criado, congratulations, Kevin. Congratulations. Yes. Yeah, we'll send you an email and uh Pete will get back to you regarding um how to uh redeem your your voucher for the next class. So there you go. Congratulations. Yes. Very cool. So Eric, on a side note, I know it's ten oh six, but did you take a look at my ASIR video or no? I did not. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not. I know <laughs> it's up anyway. I did a premiere. It's up anyway. Sorry. It's fine. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know though, but no, I. I <laughs> <laughs> no, no support. <laughs> You're late. You didn't watch it. What are you doing? You're doing nothing. What are you what doing? What are you doing? Eat, sleep, astrophotography. That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Not Absolutely. Okay. I, you know, you know I, I, I did it. I think there's only like 200 views, but you know what? It's, it's, it's pretty old because it's old technology now. Everyone's, everyone's done a video on the mini, but I just wanted to do it anyway. So there you go. But there you go. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. So it's 10.07, and we did the picture of the week. We did the giveaway, and I think we are finished for the evening. Wow. All right. So uh, I guess run, run around. Final thoughts for everybody. How about that? We'll do that, and we'll do Jerry's final thoughts, and uh, and go watch the Islander postgame show because they actually won. So go ahead, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, sorry for being late, but I hope um, – some you know you got a little bit out of the um about of the presentation um it was a lot it, personally it was fun doing it fun learning a bit more on mounts and you know how they work and now there's so many different ones and yeah i am definitely gonna have to start getting into the budget for a new mount myself <laughs> you know uh yeah, it's it's about time, especially after re doing this research. Uh, yeah, Dan's already got, Dan Dan got my mouth. <laughs> what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dan has my. Uh huh. <laughs> I'll give it at the belly rub. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Uh huh. At least, at least, you know, it's been outside on the floor. At least peppered it and pee on it. That's a good thing. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but but seriously, no. It was a, it was a, it was a fun. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, I, you know, as much as you know, I enjoy putting it together, and uh, you know, I learned something new. So I hope somebody, you know, somebody did too. You know, taking it as well in. So I appreciate it. Oh Lord, here we go. There is many like it, but this one is mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That is actually a, uh, a project that Pete and I are working on uh, in, in, in concert uh, together. Um, there's a doctor in Jersey that we're, we're working with and getting his Astro Haven and his entire disaster of a, of a it's, it's not a disaster, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice setup. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to going, going down there and hanging out a couple days and just uh, putting it all together for him. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, Mark, you're right. I probably am going to have to learn, Nina. But I think, actually, um, they did put it in, the guy, and they did put, add it to the list. So what the Knicks, I think they did add the Knicks to the ASI Airs. Oh, uh, no, 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 listen, it was it was already there. there there's, a yeah. little, there's a little kind of thing that happened mm -hmm. with the Pegasus really quick, and I'm not going to get too crazy into it. It was in the drivers. It was there, and it worked fine for a couple of weeks. And then the update came out. Something happened with the meta keywords with the update just for the Knicks. And it, it, when you tried to connect, or actually you couldn't even connect, it wasn't even in the list anymore of compatible mounts. And it just happened to oh, be wow. the day after that they went on Lunar New Year leave. 
So there was a lot of yelling and screaming over cloudy nights between ZWO and Pegasus and a whole bunch of stuff. Whatever happened, happened. When they came back, literally within a couple of days, it was fixed. Everything is fine. You can use the Pegasus. As far as, far as I know, with the um, ASIR. ASIR. So, as I, according to Simon Lewis, it was fixed within a couple of days. So, uh, so uh, it was. It was just a Eric, up. It was not on purpose. <laughs> Eric, I think people are needing to see your tree. I'm th yeah, yeah, I, I feel they're, like they're, they're, they're getting in. total tree withdrawal. <laughs> yeah, are, you I think, I you I think I all that time, I spent all that time covering it up. Now you guys want it you back. Take the dress off. Eric, <laughs> Eric, the tree is your Scott's T-shirt. <laughs> you know what you should have done? You should have thrown a piece of cheese on it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! All it needs is cheese and a ketchup potato chip, and you yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put I'll put a I'll, I'll put a slice of Swiss on the top right there next to the star. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got I got to put this comment up on the screen because I think it's funny. Oh <laughs> man! Tim Tim said I came here for the tree. I came here for the tree. <laughs> You see, see what happens is people are so used oh, to seeing everything the way it was. Oh we should make a thing. Here, here, I'm gonna make everybody. Happy. There it is. There it hey, is. Hey, what about it again? Is. What about motion number nine? Da 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 da. There it is. There it is. And I'm just I'm oh, having man. really bad images of that, that last scene awesome. on the slap shot now. I'm really having a man. just don't just wow. don't go down to the jocks for crap, okay, uh, Eric, you know. <laughs> 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 that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, there you go. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Tree. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, could this officially be considered off the rails? Because I don't think you've run that Absolutely. clip. Oh, I'm this sorry. Is, is, is so that I think you need to. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold yes. on. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So off of it. All right. All right. <laughs> There it is. There you go. Got the tree and the off the rails. All right. and, and, and I got so, so, so there's going to be an off the rails giveaway at Neef, by the way. And I'm not saying what it is yet, but hopefully, I got some feelers out there, and Jesse knows what I'm talking about. You know, there's going to be an off the rails kind of thing. It's going to be a nice. Uh, if if it could happen, I got a couple of uh, I got a couple of feelers out there to make a three D printed kind of thing. So I don't want to say what awesome. it is yet. I'm not telling you what it is, Dylan. I'm not telling you. Oh, <laughs> Eric's he's got the head going back and forth. No, it's not a bobblehead. <laughs> no, it's not a bobblehead. <laughs> and it's my probably tree. Probably not Eric's tree. <laughs> yeah, it's it's Eric's. Eric's tree in a box. <laughs> and I, oh, I'm going to have Justin man. Timberlake singing in the background. <laughs> oh, my God. Break it off. Oh, God. Oh, All right, everybody. Um, well, great listen, show man. tonight, guys. Eric, the, um, great presentation. Um, I, love, I love the visuals. I love the visuals. Thank they help. Um, yep, yep. No, nice yeah. job. Yep, yep. You sound like, you sound like Wicked guys. from Star Wars. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> right on. Oh, oh, God. That's funny. Pete, oh, final thoughts, Pete. Oh, just a great show. Eric, great presentation. Animations on the presentation. Fantastic. I mean, it really was a very good presentation. And Jesse, it's good to see you back on. Every two weeks, we'd expect you to be back on. Good. <laughs> And Dan is and always great. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, hey, we still have, and we talked about it last week, but nobody stepped up. 
let's find out what member would maybe db would be interested but let's have somebody come up step up and talk about the interpretation of the graphs and the numerical values in phd2 oh, i think that, that would be a good topic because you know everybody looks at these numbers and they just say well how do i know what my guiding is what do these numbers mean so i really think that you know what that we could do a show on that so i'm going to leave that open let's let's yeah. let's see if one of the members would be interested in stepping up and doing that presentation i could do it in about three minutes ready here you go i live in new york i'm gonna i'm, wait, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna make myself full screen for this because there you go i i live in new york the worst seeing on the planet next to dubai i don't give a crap what the numbers are <laughs> <laughs> because you know why? My seeing is so friggin' bad that no matter what How I'm driving at, it? I am not chasing seeing for anything. So as long as I'm under one, I don't care because my stars are going to be round. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> is that your TED Talk? <laughs> no, you want my TED I'll do my TED Talk. You know, you don't want that one. That's not, that's not, that's not, you know. I'm going to start doing the Jamie Tart song. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, everybody. Well, again, have a good night, everybody. You know, we, we what a great show. Eric, I can't, you know, every time you do a presentation, it's great. So great job with that, man. Really good. It's, it's, Thanks, it's pretty awesome because you do put a lot of time and effort into those, yeah. uh, and and we do appreciate it. I was I was I was making fun of you that you actually put some time into it, but you know what? It, it means a lot that you did put all that time into it. So thank you so much for doing that. Hey, and if anybody has comments, you know, and wants to even, you know, I don't know everything. I'm gonna let you guys know right right now. I don't know everything. But what I do know, I can be a little dangerous. So just watch out. Just like, I know <laughs> just enough to be half dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know I know enough to say I'm getting I'm getting a nix there. There you go. <laughs> I'm, one, one of these days I really want to do like, you know, get similar scopes. Well, not even well, it's close to similar scopes. I mean, you could use your FLT 91. I'll use my 130. Maybe Jesse could use uh, what, what do you got, Jesse? The 127, the 127 and... which is close yeah. to my 130. And Pete, mm -hmm. all he has is plane waves, so we can't use Pete. But <laughs> yeah, you know, he's got the good stuff. Yeah, he's got the good now stuff. That's <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like too far away. But you know, we could we can make a, a a like a little literal compilation of an object. We should do it this summer, and Ooh, I like take that. all of the data that we can get from Delaware, from Chicago, from New York, and Pete mm -hmm. from California. Get it all together and compile it and put it into like a hundred hour whatever thing or a 70 hour thing and just throw it all together and we'll pick an object and we'll just put it all together. Like well, somebody, do luminance, that. somebody do luminance, somebody do HA, somebody do O3, yeah, somebody do, do that too. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Like whoever has the darkest. This sky. summer, it's probably going to have to be in Cygnus. Because pretty much that's all I'm going to see ever from my yard in the summer, all summer. That's okay. The only thing I'm seeing <laughs> is uh, probably, you know, Deneb and Vega. That's, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's horrible. It's horrible here. It's horrible in New York. It's the worst, worst, horrible, 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 just horrible, horrible. horrible. Just horrible. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Unbelievable. That would actually be fun, you know, and we all, you know, like it, 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 for us to do that. And I mean, dang it. I need to, you know what? I'm going to stop. I need to stop having ideas because I have more ideas than I have, you know, whatever to put it together. But, you know, that could be something that we could even put out to, you know, our, our audience, you know, to our viewers. Like, hey, would you guys want to be in on this collab and see, like, that would be kind of really cool. Yeah. Why, you know, I think, yeah, I think that would be cool. Like what Pete said, everyone picks a filter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. So somebody Dan does yeah. RGB, somebody does luminance, somebody does HA, somebody mm -hmm. does O three. We just flap it all together and see what we come up with. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. That would be like, pretty cool. We need to remember that. I'm gonna write it down. 
you write that down. Yeah. Write, write it down. <laughs> write it down. You're, you're the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't write it with a red pen, okay? I'm not. I okay. use purple. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, have a good night. You know, I think we're, it's time to go. It's a good night, sweetheart. We're going to start singing it in a second. But uh, turn out the lights, the party's over. over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Don't forget uh, this Wednesday coming up, we got Bob Denny coming on on uh, As Come Alpaca. So definitely come on. As Come out. Alpaca, it's, awesome. Yeah, it's New gonna update. Be cool. It's going to be a great show. Um, and we're going to be doing a giveaway yet again. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, we're going to get some filters from after long. I'm still waiting to hear from them. They, they're still, I think this, I, I really think they're still catching up from the Lunar New Year. I think that a month later, I think that, you know, they're still, or oh, two weeks later. You know, I, I think they're still catching up and they're a little bit busy, but uh, but it's going to be cool to see what they give us, especially if they give it to us by need. That'll be nice. But, um, yeah, it'll be nice. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, have a good night. Take care. And we'll see you on Wednesday night. Enjoy your weekend. I think Saturday night on the East Coast is looking pretty good for the stars. I think it's going to be a good night tomorrow night. Winds are going to go down 12 mile an hour, 10 mile you an got, hour. You're getting what I've got right now, man. I'm, I'm I'm out there doing it right now, so nice. hey, it's coming your way. So tomorrow night, tomorrow night is going to be the thing. So I mean, you know, hopefully, hopefully we're going to be good to go. So everybody, again, hey, have a good night, and remember as always to keep imaging, keep educating, and clear skies. And we'll see you on Wednesday night. I got That's clear skies tonight. Yeah, uh, we like we are in, Eric. Now. We hate Eric now. <laughs> <laughs> good, night. good night, everybody. Yeah.